Welcome back. I'm Kim Bailey. She's Fuliana Osborne and today we're talking with Rodney Watson, OAM. Rodney, Fuliana and I worked together last century. We worked together during the 1980s. They're trying not to laugh. I haven't seen Rodney for under 10 years. Fuliana hasn't seen Rodney for probably over 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> so it's going to be a great catch up and we definitely have lots of things to think about and talk about. Rodney, of course, was senior management when we were working with him. And he neglected to send a bio before we met today. So I'm going to do the introduction without it and just say that Rodney's worked in a number of different places. He's worked for the public sector, both state and federal level, and he's had a business of his own in food services and he's worked in all pretty much all states of Australia, I think, at one time or another. I think it will be interesting to hear from him all sorts of things about career paths and about family life balance. Looking at some of the things that you've identified for us are issues for you in your work and your careers. What I want to ask him first of all is about the decision when he was in the private sector, when he had a food service business where he was actually making the food as well. He's very famous for sausage rolls, we'll add at this point. And a young family and made a choice, made a decision on the basis I recall being opportunities for the, the kids, for the family, to move from where he was, which is another state, to New, back to, or into New South Wales. He's not from New South Wales originally. And go back into the public sector. And I'm just interested in the decision and the upheaval and the change and the relative time of when he saw that that was the right decision. Mm. All yours, Rodney. <laughs> Thank you. I guess uh, I was in head of a takeaway food shop or also eating at Coolangatta in Queensland in 1986-87. And I had that for 20 months, but I found... One of the most difficult things associated with that is that it was not big enough to employ people. So it was really managed by myself and my wife and with some assistance from time to time from her father who used to come in for a couple of hours every second day or so. The difficulty associated with that though was seven hours, it was seven days a week and you would finish about 6.30 p.m. at night and then go home and start cooking for the next day's operations. And you would be there at 7.30, 8 o'clock the next morning to open up and start all over again. At that point in time, our children, we have three children, were attending primary school and it became a very, very difficult thing to manage and balance our family life, particularly with Sharon and my wife working in the shop between the after pick up uh, after drop off to school and before pick up from school. So we took the decision that we would sell the business, which we did, and at that time I had a have a previous had a previous background and experience in human resource management and was successful actually in obtaining a position with as human resource manager with the firm Maya in Tweed Heads. But before I started there, after being advised that I was successful for the job, the door was closed. <laughs> so that was a great start. <laughs> so back to square one. And then it was necessary to find employment. And in those days, certainly 1987, on the Gold Coast, there was not much in the way of openings for people with human resource management background in business because there was not a lot of larger businesses in the area. Fortuitously, I contacted a colleague of mine who was working in Canberra at the time in my former department who then spoke with the administrative head of the department in Sydney and he rang me and offered me a position with the Department of Housing and Construction to relocate the organisation from Sydney Shipley Square to Chatswood. 
It was a pretty exciting project to undertake because it entailed developing new conditions of service, doing office layouts and doing a staged move for some, I think, 1,400 staff at the time. This was about 12 months in the making. We were fairly well advanced with the arrangements of getting people attuned to the idea that they would be relocating to Chatswood. And in 1988, for many of the staff, moving from the Sydney city, CBD, to Chatswood was like moving to the country. So for those of you who don't know Sydney, we, we're talking about an, an office and, and staff that were located right at Wynyard, right in virtually circular key, the, almost the centre of this, the business district in Sydney, and moving out, say, you know, on a good drive, probably 20 minutes away, <laughs> a train trip, you know, for people who were coming from the other direction, it was going to mean an hour plus travel, huge change in logistics for people getting to and from work. That was all going along swimmingly, and the then that federal government of the day suddenly announced that they had sold the Chipley Square development to the Bond Corporation. There was a massive upheaval within the public service sector. The Department of Housing and Construction was to be abolished and there would be no move to Chatswood. <laughs> so there I was, two out of two. <laughs> so I found myself also looking for a job. And that came about in obtaining an executive management position with the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation, ANSTO, at Lucas Heights. Started there in late 88 and stayed there until 98 as Director of Human Resources, where it was a pretty exciting time, I suppose. There had been a lot of things that had not been undertaken for many years in terms of management and senior managers being delegated to manage their own areas, things associated with recruitment, etc. So we made some significant changes there and by 1998 I had almost worked myself out of a job. So I left that position and was offered a position with the local Member of Parliament as his electorate officer. And I started there pretty much straight away and worked with him, the late Jim Anderson at the time, uh, right through until the next election in 1995, I think it was, when unfortunately he passed away of a heart attack on the morning of the election. So that caused a bit of a, yes. a concern and by-elections and etc. and all the rest of it. Notwithstanding, I stayed on with the next local member until March 2011 when I advised him that I would be retiring from work. But also I had probably no choice because the government of the day was <laughs> defeated. And in, <laughs> and in those circumstances, if the local member is defeated, so too yes. the staff are automatically out of a job. And I guess from there on, I then spent more time, considerably more time, with volunteer work. While we're on that, you moved around quite well between one organisation and another. At the time I worked for you, I want many, many great features, and I'm not just saying that, but the, the one that stand out for me was vision, leadership and people management. To what extent those skills, qualities helped you throughout that side of your career? Uh, I think undoubtedly the people management has been one of my greatest strengths in terms of the fact that if you cannot relate and communicate effectively with people, you don't really have them come along with you on the journey. One of the tragedies, I believe, of modern technology is the fact that we communicate less. It is all now done by text, by email, by whatever, and rarely do we talk sufficiently face to face with yeah. people so that they so that you can explain to them more clearly your vision of what you see as appropriate for the organisation that you work for. But also the other upside to that is you can get great feedback from people because the worst thing you can ever do is surround yourself as a as a manager 
with people of the same ilk. You need to have people who have differences in points of view and who are able to then bounce ideas off each other because it's only then that you probably come up with the better and the best things in which to move forward. In terms of vision, I guess that one of the things for any senior manager is that you always need to be thinking about what you can do or what can be done to improve your organisation. To do that, I guess, is that you need to think outside the box. But also, when you're thinking outside that square or box, is that you need to see what other people are doing. You need to make yourself open that you can turn around and say, oh, they've tried that and that seems to have worked well there. Could it be adapted to our case? Or, well, they started that and it's been a disaster so we won't go near it. I guess I was a little bit fortunate in some ways. When I first left school and joined the workforce, I joined what was then the Postmaster General's Department. And, of course, now... Australia Post. Australia Post. (laughs) In those days, their rules and regulations were so rigid that you did everything almost by rote. But in doing that, I moved around and I went from Adelaide to Port Augusta, to Lee Creek in South Australia, the coal mining town, for those of you who don't know, (laughs) one horse and and, um, very little else. Mm -hmm. Then I was transferred to Alice Springs, and from Alice Springs, after a period of there, I was transferred to Darwin. My journey to Darwin in those days, or firstly to Alice Springs, was by the old GAN that took a couple of days to get there. (laughs) And then when I transferred from, and this is in the 1960s, to Darwin, it was three days on the mail bus. Wow. <laughs> I mean, it's just hard, I suppose, for people to, to comprehend that, that yeah. it, was the, the bar, it was a passenger bus to a point, yeah. but also, but mainly transported the, the mail. Other things. Um, Where did you stay on the road? We stayed at, I always remember the Daily Waters Hotel. <laughs> <laughs> And we stayed, I think, at Tennant Creek. Mm. So they were the two yeah. two nights and three days travel. Great. It sounds like that time and travel was very rare. Most mm. people heard those places, off those places, but never ever had the chance to see them. But you not only travel there, but work there as well, which is fantastic. Well, yeah. exactly, because Alice Springs was an eye-opener for me because mm. of the... I won't say the type of clientele, Mm. but it was a different lifestyle and a different mindset in terms of the customers that we had come into the post office. And in those days, all within that post office was the telephone exchange, so Mm. all interstate calls were all done manually and things such as that. So there's been such... There was such an incredible transition. Mm. And when I got to Darwin, it was a whole new world again. And, and quite, I won't say, well, it was an eye-opener. It was probably the best way of putting it. I was single when I first got to Darwin. The things that we, in terms of development, and the city was, was developing slowly, but a much probably in some ways, at that point in time, was considered to be rapidly developing, <laughs> but not in terms of today's standards. Yes working on the counter, but I also had other duties as I spent more time in Darwin, working in the back office, you might say, doing other administrative work, etc. Once again, the telephone exchange was there and there was a 24-hour shift work service of female telephonists, or females in those days, connecting calls all over Australia to Darwin, etc. Some fun times. I always remember one particular telephonist. She was talking to someone in Adelaide and they asked her how she got to work and she told them she rode a kangaroo and she <laughs> tied it up at the, at the hitching post. And, and this person believed her. Believed her. Another one it's sort of said, oh, yeah. you know, this crocodile sort of tied up out the front. Oh, of course, no. you know, and in those days, crocodiles were not protected. Yeah. Um, and so there were quite a number around. Uh, um, so all sorts of funny stories um, in parts of a journey of life. Just if you look at all of that in one grouping... Are there elements of what you've learnt of how you work 
that you've carried through from those times? How to deal with people, I think, was yeah. probably the mm. most significant of all. The number and the types of people that you met came from all True. walks of life. Yes. Not only working with them in their employment, but also with the customer, the general public of Darwin in particular, yes. where it was a very transient population as well as some locals who had businesses and their business and things such as that. But it was interesting sort of when you dealt with the transient population who came in each day, their mail was addressed, care of the post office Darwin. We had a huge bank of mail area for transient people because they had no specific place of abode. It was, it was quite interesting. But learning to how to deal with them and share their disappointments of no mail mm. to other things that happened, etc. Mm. Yeah, I think certainly the, that's where the communication yeah. has to be, I believe, your first port of call for anything in a business. You spent a lot of, well, let's say all your career in people yeah. activities, yes. either face to face or managing them or all those yeah. sort of. Do you ever get tired of it? Do you ever get tired of people? <sighs> Look, from time to time, there's no doubt you say, let me lock myself away. <laughs> um, from time to time, yeah, you did. Certainly in Darwin, I originally lived in a hostel where there was hundreds of people staying there. And then I eventually rented at least a, a flat out in, in the suburbs where I had greater time to myself. And I found that that was good in that you could still have your downtime, but then I was involved with sport as well, so I spent time as well then interacting with people outside of the workplace. So, so you've got a bit of both, but yeah, I, I look, I really think that from time to time, you do need to have that time away, because particularly if you get some difficult customers, yeah. and my word, we have them <laughs> yeah. from time to time, and abusive, and, yeah. and it's learning how to, to cope with that abuse without firing back, either reducing yourself to their level or making yourself look stupid by saying things that you should not say. Uh, and that, that was a, probably one of the most important learning tools that I yeah. got early in my career. Listening to you, you're talking about how to approach people, how to communicate, get to know your audience, the environment, etc. We've got a lot of listeners that are international. So when you look at that, it's the same. It's understanding the culture. So if yes. you go to work in another country, it's understanding the culture. You're understanding their way of thinking and doing things, respecting their customs. That's what you're yeah. talking about, like in Darwin. Yeah. Even the sense of humour, that would not work anywhere else. But again, assimilating, that's a good lesson, is whatever you are, people are people. Customer still a customer, and you're occasionally going to get annoyed with the customers and you need to re-energise. <laughs> yeah, that's so yeah. true. And I think I would say to in, any person aspiring into managerial roles, the first thing that you need to do when you're working your way along up that ladder is to sit back and observe, and observe the behaviours mm -hmm. of others around you. See what approach you're, you would have in terms of, is that behaviour an acceptable behaviour, or does that behaviour need modifying yeah. in terms of how they also operate within the office? Mm -hmm. And I think some of that's, a, probably born within the person. They've got to have a, a bit of a bent for life. Not everyone's going to be in human resource management. Others are going to be the salespersons and all that, and they have different sorts of, of pitches and different sorts of needs. But overall, it comes back to one thing, how effectively you communicate with whatever culture it be. And in this day and age of, of where, particularly within Australia, the, the multicultural situation yeah. of employment in particular is vast. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so critical that we have, whether we like it or not, mm -hmm. a clear understanding of what or where the person that you're talking to is coming from as well. Mm -hmm. So, and that's only by by learning, perhaps on the job to a point, their culture and what their culture is also about. Just before we got straight onto this, I had a beautiful segue to go from what we were talking about into sport. 
Mm. Now, you've blown that out of the water. So I'm going to have to ask you a specific question. So you did all of this stuff and you retired. And yeah. then the thing that was your break from work as in sport then became your focus. I guess my segue into sport really started in Darwin. In 1965, a friend of mine said, oh, we're going to start up another hockey club in Darwin. And they knew that I'd played hockey when I lived in Adelaide and said, do you want to play? And I said, oh, yeah, I'll have a go. Because I wasn't, I was only playing tennis at that point in time in Darwin. So I took up playing hockey and informing the club, I fell into the role of president. I was president, which meant sort of looking after some administrative aspects of things, which was a very fast learning curve. I then took up some coaching of the Northern Territory women's team in 1970 and was ultimately made a life member of that hockey club. In 1966 was elected to the position of Honorary Secretary of the Northern Territory Hockey Association and during that time we initiated the process to gain affiliation with the All Australia Hockey Association so it was really getting into admin governance type Mm. issues Mm. again. I have to say I'm struggling with with an organisation I'm working with at the moment. But for those of you who are listening who are part of organisations outside of your work environment, they do need these structures. They do need these affiliations. They do need to have a business-like approach to the framework for the organisation. Unless you have good governance, you don't have a good club. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. It's as simple as that. I was married in 1970 and so for a while I just played sport. I didn't do any admin when we were first married and that continued for a while and then in 1974 Cyclone Tracy hit and um, (laughs) we were relocated. to. Well, I had an opportunity to go back to to Darwin but if I went back I had to go back by myself and at that point in time we had a six-week-old daughter Vanessa and it would have been for over 12 months without seeing my wife and daughter so I chose to relocate to Canberra in the Federal Public Service, the Department of Health where I then previously worked in Darwin. I played a little bit of sport in Darwin, actually played in Canberra, I played golf and my wife and I used to take it in turns, I'd play Saturday and she'd play Sunday or vice versa (laughs) while the other one minded her, then we had at second and third child, both in Canberra. Then in 85, I moved to Tweed Heads and 87 back to Darwin, back to Sydney, goodness me, back to Sydney. And then uh, in 1988, my registered my daughters with to play netball for St Clair. One didn't have a team to play in, the other one commenced playing. And within one week of the commencement was asked to be the team manager. (laughs) So away we go again. (laughs) And from there it really just spiralled almost out of control. At the same time I was following my son who played hockey. He previously played, he initially played soccer but then took up hockey. In 1990 I was asked to be the senior umpire convener at St Clair Netball Club and I did that for a couple of years. Then in 1992, I took over as president of St Clair Netball Club. And in 1993, I was also approached to be the rep convener of the Penrith District Netball Association. I was managing those two sorts of things and also managing my work as executive manager and then also assisting with my wife in managing the children in terms of running them to and from training and she did a lot of that because I wasn't home at that point in time from work but then of the weekends we would be sharing the workload of driving the children to sport. Tell us a bit how that felt because for some people it's overwhelming you seem to have an element of enjoyment in doing it tell us about that. You've got to enjoy it. If you don't enjoy it, you don't do it. But for mine, in those days, you just did it because yeah. you, I believe, you know, you have a ch- your children and it's important for them to play sport. It's important, critically important for them to be outside of the home environment. Now, I guess we were a little bit more lucky and one day I decry this day and age where we have so many latchkey children sitting inside, playing in front of computers, 
playing yeah. computer games when they should be outside playing sport yeah. or Doing playing something. in the dirt. Yeah. You know, we, we've got to shift that back that we get kids outside again. In terms of doing that, it was also good because when you went to sport and took them to sport, you met other people. Yes. And so once again, you developed a network of friends mm -hmm. because whenever you relocate from one town to another or city yeah, to another, yes. you know no one. Mm. You've got to start all over yeah. again in terms of building up uh, and having a relationship base with other people. Because yes. otherwise you have a very, very lonely life if you have no one yeah. outside your only family to communicate mm. with. I think also, by doing those sorts of things, it was a great break from being at work, using yeah. your head all the time, the brain, yeah. so to speak, and then going out and just mm. relaxing in an open environment yeah. of watching your children play sport. Yeah. yeah. A di so, different set of responsibilities, a different yeah. set of, a uh, different focus of technical yeah. skills. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And so, I guess that in terms of my early days, and then in 1994 mm. I was approached to stand to be president of the Penrith District Netball Association. That was all happened in this really quick time because days just sail by. Yeah. But going from 1992 when I was president of a local club to 94 in the space of less than two years, president of the association which had over three and a half thousand people, players registered, 20 something clubs. You were the pinnacle, you were there to set the standard in terms of, and that's one of Kim's original names for a training course she ran <laughs> back in the 19... It is. Setting, 80, the, setting, setting the, the standard. standard. Yes. But it, and that's what you need to do. In that time from 1994 into 2012 when I had to relinquish the post of Penrith, uh, President, I presided over significant growth, the infrastructure development, because all of that is the role of a President. For those of you who don't know the geographical area, this is an area where there would be old established clubs that have been around for a long time, yeah. plus very new yeah. development, yeah. new housing developments, young yeah. families yeah. who hadn't been necessarily yeah. involved in sport as yeah. as children that were now bringing their own children into the sport. Exactly. Yeah. And, and young people and people moving into the area from elsewhere, uh, and we were taking girls and the odd boy mm -hmm. into netball from age five up. We had different programs which were program specific for the various age groups. One of the things, once again, I get back to governance, was I introduced stronger governance. Mm. And we reviewed our constitution. And we established, I established, but since then, some reward systems, like the Penrith Service Award, which was to recognise those volunteers who did outstanding service for their club, not for the association, but yeah. at the grassroots level. Yeah. It is just so difficult, it was mm. then, but even more difficult now in this day and age, to get people to volunteer, mm. but to understand what they need to do for their own clubs. In the 1990s, there were more women at home than what there is in this day and age. It's now, incredibly difficult and, and I understand why to get long-term volunteers into sporting clubs who will stay with that club for a fair period of time as well as manage their family work full-time or part-time but main you know long hours of work get home manage their family put the meals on the table etc and then have time to go to meetings and attend to sport so it's an incredible balancing life that you need to have and you've got to have whether for those that are married with a partner they need to have a clear understanding and make sure that they can work in harmony together. We're going to take a break there in our discussion with Rodney Watson about administration of sports and its comparison with administration in the business world. Please join us for part two where we'll go on to discover a little bit more about the similarities between the two styles of management. But for now, I'm Kim Bailey, she's Fuliana Osborne, and we're talking with Rodney Watson. This is Inside Exec. Thank you.